So uh, this next talk is called To the Nines. Uh, it's a peek into Uber's payment processing systems, more of the backend systems, and the challenges of being correct in this industry where being wrong is so expensive. Uh, quick intro, I'm Paul Sorensen. I work here in San Francisco on the money team. Uh, we call ourselves the payment optimization team. We do a lot of things, but uh, for the focus of this talk, some of the work that we do is uh, on the collection and disbursement instruments on the back end, as I just mentioned. Uh, the next step, we'll, we'll go over a little anecdotes of being wrong and the cost of it and how to be as right as possible because you can never really be 100% correct. We strive for 99.9999, repeating of course, percent uh, correctness. So as you've already seen from the previous talks, the infrastructure is actually quite vast. Um, this is a gross oversimplification of it, just so we can kind of paint the picture of what area we're talking about. Um, requests come through from the accounting service, which is uh, what the mission Stephen talked about. And they have a lot of systems in there that you learned about. And then there's also payment grants, which is uh, making auths. Those come through and then they are routed to uh, instrument integrations. And those can be either pretty simple or pretty complex, depending on what we're integrating with. And uh, in case there are people who have never heard the words that I'm using here today, I have some definitions for you. Uh, a disbursement is the payment of money to a partner. A collection is the acquiring of money from a customer. A PSP stands for Payment Service Provider. It offers online services for accepting electronic payments. An example is Stripe or Braintree. And hopefully everyone knows what a bank is. Uh, <laughs> hope you have one. Uh, but it's an establishment authorized by the government to facilitate financial transactions and other stuff that we all know about, hopefully. So uh, what goes into a payment? For PSPs, most often than not, you are going to be talking over HTTPS with a JSON endpoint, uh, API. Uh, you will probably make a single request to initiate a transaction and you will get a single response. For example, if we were going to auth a credit card, we would say, hey, I'd like to auth this credit card. And then Range would be like, okay, cool. Here's your answer. We'll maybe approve or decline it, right? Now, when you do these direct integrations with banks, uh, it's a little bit different. You usually talk over SFTP or a similar protocol, and you send a file, which is a collection of transactions, uh, and then you will have to pull for the response file, which is also a collection of responses. So you're thinking, okay, it's pretty simple. Yeah, everyone's done this before. What can go wrong? Well, here's a, a list of stuff that we are responsible for preventing. Lack of payment, duplicate payments, incorrect currency conversion, incorrect payment, dangling authorizations, there's just some of them, right? And it's, uh, you know, still pretty kind of not a great example of, okay, well, let's just not do that, right? But uh, let's quantify it with a hypothetical situation. So let's say that 0.01% of the time, we have a bug that creates like a double charge on a, on a user's account. And that's, so in, in other words, we're 99.9% .9 correct. And it costs us $15, uh, $15 to fix that bug. And let's pretend that we have a million transactions a day in this particular instrument. Um, this is what it would look like as your throughput grows. It becomes more and more co costly. So I think we always talk about, here are these numbers. Uh, yeah, these numbers sound good, but what does it actually add up to at the end of the day? And as you can see, the 99.9% uh, .9 scenario gives you like $15,000 a day of cost. Now, if we improve that to five nines in the green, it's only $150. I know this uh, graph isn't great, but it's Google Sheets. So um, as these numbers grow, these become costlier and costlier. And of course, you might be thinking, well, it's just you know money. We can throw money at the problem. But there's also the user experience of every outage that you have, right? And so there's probably outages in your life that don't bother you much, like things fail all the time, right? So an example is maybe uh, you're on a social network and you're like, hey, I wanna to talk to my best friend and it pulls up Jim, but you want her to talk to Bob and you're like, oh, well, you know, Jim's a pretty good guy too, so let's talk to him instead, right? <laughs> you, uh, you might just have a power outage overnight, it's not a big deal, you reset your clocks, right? And then uh, maybe you uh, 
wanted to go to your grocery store and they didn't have your favorite food or you really had your heart set on coconut LaCroix, but they only had pomplamoose. So you're going to walk home with pomplamoose and uh, go on with your life, right? On the other side of the coin, there are things that really upset you in life. And uh, a good example might be you have some photos from college that somehow showed up on that social network that you didn't want your family to see. And now you have to have a frank conversation over Thanksgiving dinner. Um, not exactly pleasant. It doesn't just go away. You might have a power outage during your fantasy football draft. This actually happened to me and uh, my girlfriend's in the audience and she can definitely confirm that I flipped out really bad <laughs> and I ended up with an awful team and my season was shot. So that's how that, that went. Uh, but to, to change the tone a little bit, if you showed up to that grocery store and you couldn't buy any food because your place of work didn't pay you, that's a really big deal that affects your life. And for many of us here, we're probably lucky enough to have savings accounts and we can absorb something like this. But there are many people in the world that live paycheck to paycheck. And when you don't pay them, it can create a lot of complications in their life. And that's unacceptable to them and to the institution providing payment services. So if you run a payments company, that would be you, right? Uh, any failure in payments, is usually really bad. There's usually no one that's like, hey, hey, we just had an outage today. It's great. It's no, it's usually a very, very bad conversation and it's not good. So this is where we uh, dig into a little bit of the things that we have created here uh, or we are rolling out here at Uber to help us stay correct, to be as correct as possible. Um, and because we operate at kind of a, a pretty high scale, I think the number was 15 million trips a day and then we have eats and this number is growing and growing and some of these solutions that we've had before are starting to break on us and we have to come up with smarter ways of doing things. So I'm going to talk about uh, our storage patterns for multiplexing between different instruments and retries. I'm going to talk about uh, generating external IDs and uh, deterministic batching and so if you don't know what these things are I'll cover them in the next few slides. So to begin with uh, storage, you probably would have seen this example before. If you, um, any of the PSPs that you integrate will more often than not provide some level of duplicate checking or item potency. And that's something that you can lean on pretty heavily if this is your only integration. So in this example, a PSP integration uh, would try to make a author charge request. And of course, because things fail, you could have a successful response that you never receive. So let's say that you have retries because you're thinking ahead and you want to get your money, which is totally reasonable, and you go back and uh, you should basically receive your previous response or a duplicate error. But the moment that you add another instrument to the mix, this becomes a little bit uh, more difficult. You can't just rely on those systems anymore. In this case, if you were to, for instance, maybe charge a credit card and then in the, in the process, the network cut out to that credit card processing network and you wanted to fall back to perhaps maybe, maybe Google Pay or something, just a random example, and you uh, successfully charged that, you would have, as shown, shown here, double charged the customer, but you would only have a record of one charge in your system. So it would be really hard to detect and fix. This is uh, where we add storage. And this is where we then rely on the downstream systems item potency. So we have to uh, track each request and response in storage before making the call and after receiving the response. And this way, if we go out to PSPA and it crashes, we know when we retry that we have to go back to PSPA to figure out what happened there and reconcile the response. And this is where you would also time things out. So you might be like, hey, uh, looks like we made this call 10 minutes ago. It's probably safe to say that it crashed, so let's go back. Um, and this is a diagram of how that actually works. As you can see, store the request first, make the call to the, to the PSP, receive the response hopefully, and then store the response. And just one point here, you wanna make sure you're using strong, consistent systems here and not eventual because you need to be able to read what you just wrote to enforce the duplicate checking on your end. So uh, on to the next part, external IDs. Well, most of the time, 
on these newer integrations, you can just take your internal ID and uh, send it as your external ID for them to do their duplicate checking on. But when you work with these older APIs, they don't always offer enough space to put a whole UUID in there. For example, you might only have eight alphanumeric characters. You might think it's a good idea to make your own random IDs, um, and it could work if you have a low enough throughput for a while, but you need to have collision handling on them. So that could get expensive as you scale, and that collision handling also has to be strongly consistent. So you rack up calls to a, some sort of storage. And um, because these IDs are actually, there's a lim limited number space of, of IDs, you may be at a high enough throughput where you will run through all the IDs in a year. So these IDs, while they're unique for the time being, it's, it's a reminder that they're only temporary. So our system that we have designed, it has what we have, I like to call it the tiny URL for IDs, uh, but we have these ID generator clients that request batches of IDs and then hold them in memory and serve one uh, single request to every transaction needing an ID. So as you can see in the diagram, you have the three clients there. The first one has one through 100 uh, IDs that it has allocated. The next client has 101 through 200, and the third one has 201 through 300. And let's say if the first client ran through all 100 IDs, it would know to request the new batch before it is done. And then it would have probably in this diagram 301 through 400. Um, because these ID generators, like a, a, you can request from any of these ID generators, it's not actually a sequence. It could, uh, a valid sequence of transactions up there could have the IDs of 101, 1, 2, 201, 102. So I like to call that the fuzzy sequence. Uh, it's kind of my pet name for it, but I, I think we have a more mature name. But this is uh, what it kind of looks like when you look at the number space. And as you can see here, we try to keep all of the IDs that we've used around the time that we're using them close together so that we have a nice set of unused IDs as we move forward. And uh, you'll also notice that because of those ID generators, they are uh, keeping IDs in memory. They could also fail because everything can fail. And when they do, they will forego whatever batch of IDs they have. So you will have gaps in your IDs However, it is better than having random IDs and having gaps everywhere in your, in your number space. And then eventually, once you do reach the max, it'll just overlap back to, a, to one. So that's how that works. And uh, lastly, we're going to talk about our determinist, uh, deterministic bashing system. Because we operate with files, we have to aggregate our transactions in real time and then queue them up for a file-based transaction uh, list of transactions later. So the requirements that we have is it has to be deterministic, which meaning like if you retry your generation, it has to, to come up with the same list of groups and uh, files. So that way, if you crash the halfway through, you will have the same output each time. Um, you also need to ensure that only one group or, or file it has a trans, uh, only one transaction, one transaction belongs to one group or file. You don't want to have that showing up on multiple files. And that's a guarantee that we have to make. And then we also have to guarantee that no drops or delays occur when we generate these files. And this is a, a diagram that shows what that looks like. Uh, as you can see, we have these, uh, an item handler or a transaction handler and that will schedule a time-based a time callback for a specific quantized time slot. I'll show a diagram of that next. And then it will store the transactions and then save them for later once it receives the trigger. When it receives the trigger, it will then generate all the groups and create the, the response containing the groups and let the systems that are using it that are responsible for file-based communication generate their files as, as, uh, as needed. The, uh, this is sort of my diagram that explains what it kind of looks like. Uh, the time slots, as I said, were quantized, meaning that you have a cadence and you try to attach a transaction to a specific time at which it would be okay to go out. 
to the world. And you, um, as you can see, in the first case, uh, excuse me, a time slot could, pre, uh, could create more than one group. And it depends on whatever throughput we have, and then we would have three files there. And it would also prevent any of these transactions from uh, joining a late a group in a late. And it, as you can see on the right, it only accepts the valid transaction. So that's pretty much the deep dive into our backend components. Uh, just to recap, use strongly consistent storage for request and response tracking. Generate your external IDs correctly and efficiently and use deterministic batching and reliable scheduling because correctness of payments actually does affect people's lives. And that's definitely what I find the most interesting and important thing about working in this industry. Thank you, everyone.